In this video we're going to be looking at some electric start system maintenance tips on late model KTM, Husqvarna and gas gas models including TPI. In this video I'm going to be working on my 2021 KTM 300 TPI but all 250 and 300 two-stroke uh, KTM and Husqvarna models since 2017 have had the same starter system with some minor detail differences. So you'll find the uh, tips I share in this video um, applicable to those models too. And if you're watching this video because your bike has an electric starter issue, uh, this video is intended to cover maintenance to help prevent issues occurring. Uh, but I did make a different video which goes through um, a process of debugging issues with the eStart system. I'll put a uh, link to that video in the description of this one. In the 2020 KTM owner's manual it recommends checking the electric starter drive every 80 hours or every 40 hours if used for motorsport. And interestingly in the 2017 operator's manual um, which was the first year of the redesigned electric starter system. It recommends uh, doing the check every 40 hours or 10 hours if used for motorsports. But really a lot depends on how much you use the uh, starter system. If you're doing more open riding and not using the starter very much, um, you can uh, lengthen the uh, interval. Uh, if on the other hand, if you're doing a lot of tight riding and a lot of stopping and starting, uh, you'd want to check it more regularly. And I should also mention that uh, bikes since the 2020 model uh, don't come fitted standard with a Kickstarter. Um, so the electric starter system reliability is extremely important. Uh, if you do want to fit a Kickstarter on your 2020 or 2021, um, I made a video covering that, um, which I'll put a link to that video in the description this one, in case you want to check that out. Okay, so let's get started on the maintenance. So the first thing I'm going to inspect and maintain is the starter switch, and then it has a, uh, a wire running down here uh, to this connector under here, which you can just see. Um, this simply unplugs. Um, I'm actually going to uh, take my starter switch off the bike and inspect it on the bench just because it's a little bit easier to see on video. But if you're doing this at home you can leave it on the bike, no problem. And one big reason I decided to make this video is during a ride last week uh, one of my riding buddies who's on a 2020 KTM Erzberg uh, had big problems with his starter switch. So initially um, it was making intermittent contact and then it ended up uh, making no contact at all and uh, the root cause was uh, we opened up the switch and uh, internally it was really badly corroded um, and also the connector down here was badly corroded so this is definitely something uh, you want to inspect regularly and maintain and when working on the electrical system it's a very good idea to disconnect the battery to help ensure no uh, shorting issues or accidentally operating the starter motor. So I'm going to disconnect the battery ground connection and uh, then proceed with my maintenance work. And here you can see the starter switch assembly on the bench. Uh, very simple, uh, it's got the switch, short uh, cable and then the connector. So the switch is uh, normally open, high impedance. When you press the starter switch uh, it closes the switch and uh, connects the two connector wires together. Um, on the 2021 uh, TPI bikes uh, you're actually switching uh, the starter solenoid to ground so the control terminal is switched to ground uh, via this uh, connector. Um, on the earlier bikes, so for example the 2017, um, you're switching the control terminal to 12 volts so um, there's a difference there but uh, the starter switch assembly is the same on uh, all year bikes from 2017. So first you want to inspect the connector and uh, make sure the terminals are clean. Uh, my bike is still relatively new and it hasn't had a, a lot of water. I store it uh, inside in the garage and uh, you can see the terminals are in really good shape, nice and clean. So no problem there. Um, if your bike has uh, seen a lot of water and particularly if you pressure wash it, um, you might find that uh, the terminals are quite corroded. If the corrosion is slight you can try cleaning it off. 
Uh, if it's very bad, um, you either want to replace the connector and terminals or buy a new assembly. And then to help maintain uh, the good terminal connection, um, I'm going to apply some silicone grease. Uh, you can use dielectric grease as well, uh, it's very similar. And I'm applying it with a pick tool. It's quite fiddly to get in there, um, so you need something small. And then just coat the, uh, each of the terminals with some grease. And you want to do the same uh, for the uh, connector underneath the triple clamps. So the grease doesn't actually improve the electrical connectivity. Uh, what it does is uh, helps prevent moisture getting in there and it helps prevent corrosion. Um, so it's, this connector itself is not waterproof, so I think uh, this is a really good idea and uh, will definitely help improve the reliability of the uh, starter system. And then the starter switch itself, you want to inspect it, make sure the uh, rubber cover isn't damaged, mine looks fine. Um, and then you can flip it over and you'll see a gasket here. You want to make sure that isn't damaged and in place. Uh, if it is damaged, it will allow uh, water to get in inside and uh, that can result in uh, bad corrosion. Um, and then I'm actually going to take it apart. So it's got uh, two tabs, one here and one on the other side. If you push these in, uh, you can disassemble the switch and uh, examine the terminals inside. Okay, so using this small flat bladed screwdriver, I managed to um, push down on the tabs either side and uh, be able to loosen up the switch and remove it. So inside you can see there's some uh, small components. So there's a spring here, which you can see. And uh, on here, you can see the actual connections. So there's one terminal here and one terminal here. Um, I mentioned on my Riding Buddies uh, 2020 Erzberg, uh, these had completely corroded, so there was nothing left of these terminals, and they actually uh, stick up about one millimeter. Um, so if they corrode, um, you're going to have starting issues. And then on the other part, you can see uh, a spring, and there's also a... Uh, a plate there which makes the actual uh, connection across the terminals. So here you can see the switch disassembled. Uh, the spring sits inside the hole here in the switch um, and the plate uh, sits above the terminals. So normally it's not touching the terminals then when you press the switch down it will uh, short these two terminals out. Um, so you want to make sure the terminals are in good condition, no corrosion and also uh, this circular plate has no corrosion on it. Uh, if the corrosion is very slight, you can try cleaning it off. Uh, if it's bad, I would just replace the switch, put a new one in. Um, what I'm gonna do is, uh, it looks like it's already got some grease on it. I'm gonna add some more silicone grease and then reassemble it. And now I have this switch reassembled and before I put it back onto the bike I'm going to do a quick uh, test using a multimeter on the resistance range. Um, so I've got uh, the meter connected to the terminals on the connector and when I press the switch you can see it goes low impedance so it's measuring about 0.22 ohms which is good and when I release it it goes high impedance. So that's operating uh, correctly, uh, I'll put this back on the bike. And here you can see the starter switch connector underneath the triple clamps on the right hand side. Um, so four way connector. Um, I've also put some silicone grease inside here. You can use dielectric grease if you have it. Okay, so I've finished the inspection of the starter switch and I've reinstalled it. Uh, the starter switch wiring uh, is carried through this harness here uh, back to the solenoid by the battery. And one common failure point is in this area by the headset. Um, so when you turn the handlebars, uh, this wiring harness moves and you can find over time uh, it cracks. 
So you can see um, even on mine, it's only done 39 hours and the outer uh, cover has already cracked. And if you just leave it like this, it'll get worse and uh, the wires inside will start, uh, the insulation will crack and eventually the wires themselves will uh, break. So it's important to inspect this regularly and if you see any damage to fix it or you could have issues while riding. So what I'm going to do, uh, very minor damage, I'm just going to wrap some insulation tape around here to better support it and hopefully stop it getting any worse. If yours has uh, wires inside which have been damaged, you'll have to repair that or replace the uh, wiring harness. I know that the harness is very expensive, so it's probably best just uh, repairing it. If damage is very bad, what you can do is cut out a section of wire, sold in, solder in new wires, and then uh, insulate it all. Okay, so here you can see my repair. I've just uh, wrapped some insulation tape. Uh, I've did uh, three layers and uh, hopefully that will better support this area and uh, prevent it getting any worse. Okay, so I've moved back to the starter solenoid or relay, uh, which you can see here. And these are typically pretty reliable. I've never ha had one go bad on any of my bikes, um, but I'm gonna uh, check the connector on the bottom and also the 12 volt uh, connection, which is switched to the starter motor and make sure the terminals are tight on that. And the solenoid is held on uh, with this rubber boot and just slides off. And then you can carefully um, lift it up like that and then you can unplug it. So I'm going to unplug the connector which has the uh, control to it from the starter switch. Uh, you want to inspect the terminals both here and on the solenoid and make sure they're not corroded. Uh, mine look nice and clean. I'm just going to put some uh, silicone grease in there and that will hopefully pr prevent any corrosion in the future. And when you're doing this you want to make sure that you don't pry the terminals uh, apart or that might result in a bad connection. So uh, be very careful about that. Okay, and then the 12 volt uh, switch connection, uh, which goes to the starter motor. Um, so there's two connectors, there's one here and one here. Uh, you want to make sure that uh, the screws are tight and that the connector cannot move. And both of mine look really good, uh, they're not moving, so I'm not actually going to um, make any changes to it. But it's a very good idea to inspect that. Um, particularly if it, it gets loose, um, it can be prone to getting corroded and then you might have intermittent starting issues. So make sure that they're nice and tight and then you can put the rubber boot back and uh, plug in uh, the connector again on the underside. And then uh, just remount it uh, onto the battery holder. Okay, so next you can check your battery connections. Uh, so the positive 12 volt connection um, needs to be secure and nice and clean, no corrosion. Uh, if it does look corroded, uh, remove it, clean it off with a wire brush, and then you can use some dielectric grease or silicone grease and make sure it's secure. Uh, the ground side is off, often uh, problematic, particularly the connection to the subframe. Um, so if it looks at all corroded, uh, take it apart, clean it off very well with a wire, wire brush and then use some uh, silicone grease or dielectric grease to help ensure that uh, it doesn't get corroded in the future. And you want all of your connections uh, nice and tight. I'm going to leave this undone for now because I haven't finished my uh, inspection. Um, but when you finish, obviously you need to reconnect it and make sure it's secure. Um, one issue, uh, one common issue is, uh, as I mentioned, ground connection onto the subframe. Uh, one of my riding buddies just recently, as you can see here in this photo, um, had a problem with the ground plate on the uh, subframe. It actually cracked, became loose, and then he was having intermittent starting issues. Uh, he got it rewelded, uh, not a problem now. Um, that was caused by uh, the subframe bolts uh, coming loose and not being uh, checked and tightened. 
So very important to keep all of your bolts secure. So check them regularly, make sure everything is uh, nice and tight. And I recommend using some thread lock on the subframe bolts. And here you can see the subframe screws. So there's one up here, one here, and the same on the other side. So a total of four screws, and they connect the subframe uh, to the main frame. And it's important they stay tight, um, not just for mechanical integrity, but also electrically. Um, so it's recommended to use medium strength uh, thread lock and to torque these to 35 Newton meters. Um, and the starter motor only has a uh, 12 volt uh, terminal and the ground connection is made via the engine uh, through the frame up through the subframe uh, to the battery. So if these become loose, you can start getting intermittent starter motor issues. So very important to keep these uh, tight and make sure they don't come loose. Okay, so I've moved to the right lower part of the engine and uh, you can see the starter motor here and the 12 volt uh, supply to the starter motor. So th this goes via the starter solenoid and is switched when you press the starter button. Um, normally it has this rubber boot over the terminal to uh, stop it shorting out and uh, to keep water and mud off it. So when you inspect it, inspect the terminal, make sure it's not corroded and that this nut is uh, secure. If it does look corroded, recommend taking it apart, cleaning it off with a wire brush, uh, reassemble, make sure the nut is secure. Uh, as I mentioned before, the ground connection is via the engine. Uh, so it's important these bolts are nice and tight and uh, it has a good uh, ground connection to the battery via the, the engine and frame and subframe. Okay, so I've completed the starter system electrical uh, inspection and maintenance. And next I'm gonna look at the mechanical components. And the main one is the starter uh, Bendix, which is located behind this cover. So I'm gonna remove the gear shifter and this cover and then inspect that. And the ignition cover has nine screws and uh, they're different lengths. So what I like to do is make a template like this. Uh, it only takes a, a few seconds to make. And then when you take the screws out, you can put them in a template. And uh, when you come to reinstall it, it's very easy. And uh, you don't have to think about which screw goes where. So you can save a lot of time just using a simple template like this. And when removing the screws, it's a good idea to do uh, the loosening in a crisscross pattern. Uh, there's so many screws, um, there's no particular order, but it's just a good idea to relieve the uh, stress on the cover as evenly as possible. So once they're all loose, you can go ahead and start taking them out. Okay, so I've removed all the screws. Um, there's seven 20 millimeter screws and two longer ones. So 25 millimeter here and here. And I forgot to mention that the bike is lying on its side on the handlebars are on a uh, work stand. And I like to do it on its side. It's much easier. Uh, well, I find it much easier uh, to work on it like this than uh, if it's standing up. So I've removed all the screws. I can uh, carefully lift off the ignition cover now. And then uh, you don't want to strain uh, the wire, um, so you can flip it over and uh, position it out of the way. Okay, so with the ignition cover off, you can now see the starter system mechanical components. So this is the starter motor down here, and the Bendix, and then the flywheel. And what happens when you press your starter switch, uh, the starter motor spins, this turns the Bendix, uh, which this portion of the Bendix flies out and engages in the flywheel, which turns over the motor and it starts. So things I'm noticing, uh, my bike has 39 hours on it. Uh, the flywheel teeth are completely dry. So I think in the factory they put some grease on it, uh, but because it spins round, uh, the grease just flies off and doesn't come back onto it. So uh, that's one reason I like to uh, use oil rather than grease when I uh, reassemble everything. 
Uh, the other reason is that if you use grease, um, it flies off and it can make its way into the Bendix internal parts, which will make it sticky. Um, so it's much better, I think, to use some lightweight oil uh, to lubricate the internal parts. And the Bendix is held in place with two bushings. So there's one bushing, which you can see here in the ignition case. Um, and looking at this, it doesn't look too bad. It doesn't look as though it's been spinning, which is very good. On early models, uh, they're very prone to the bush spinning. Uh, this one looks okay, but you can see uh, some signs of wear already um, on this portion of the bushing. And the other bushing is uh, in the engine case um, underneath the Bendix. So to look at that, you need to remove the uh, Bendix. And like I was just mentioning, uh, around the ignition cover, you can see it's coated in grease, um, which has just flung off the uh, flywheel. So there's none on the flywheel at all. Um, and the grease is doing nothing there. So I really don't think it's a good idea to use grease. It doesn't really do very much. And then to inspect the Bendix, uh, you need to remove it. And it is possible just to remove it by lifting it out. Um, there is enough room. If you get it aligned, oh, that came out very easily. Um, that kind of indicates possibly uh, the bushing is getting worn. But uh, yeah. Um, it's possible to do it that way. If you're having problems, uh, you can remove the flywheel, obviously. If you've got a flywheel puller and you need a, uh, a strap or a uh, tool to hold the flywheel in place and remove the flywheel. Um, that came off so easily. I, I'm not going to bother removing the flywheel and do it this way. So here you can see the Bendix on the bench and you want to perform a thorough inspection of all parts. So the shaft should have no wear on and all of the teeth should have no wear or damage. Um, so the shafts, both ends look uh, very good, no wear. And then you want to go around and check all of the teeth, make sure uh, there's no damage, no broken bits. Um, this, this end engages in the starter motor. Um, so when the starter motor turns, the Bendix will turn like this and it will throw this portion out and these teeth will engage in the flywheel. Um, so all of these teeth look good. Um, I don't see any problems. If you do have any damage, uh, you should replace the Bendix by a new one. Um, and then check the action of the Bendix. It should be very smooth. There should be no uh, resistance and it shouldn't stick. So you can test that by uh, watching how it, it uh, goes back into the body. Uh, if it does stick, um, you can either buy a new Bendix or you can uh, try cleaning it out. So you can squirt some parts cleaner inside, uh, then blow it out with uh, compressed air, and then you can use some dry lube or some lightweight oil. Do not use grease or a, a oil which tacks up. Uh, that would make it uh, worse and you'd have problems. So mine looks good. I'm actually going to just leave it how it is. I haven't been having any problems with the Bendix engagement. Um, so I'm going to continue using it like this. The Bendix shaft is supported between the crankcase and the uh, ignition cover using bushings. Uh, so he here you can see two stock bushings. Uh, this one is a standard length bushing and was used on 2017, 2018 and, two and some 2019 models. Um, the longer bushing was used in all models from 2020 and some 2019 models. Uh, one issue with the stock bushing is that uh, you can see here, um, both of them have a slit in them. And this can make the bushing prone uh, to spinning in the uh, bore. And if it spins, it creates wear on the, uh, the case and uh, can be expensive and difficult to repair. So um, each time you inspect uh, the Bendix, I recommend replacing uh, the stock bushings with new ones. They're very cheap and it's relatively easy to replace them. Uh, the other option uh, is to replace the stock bushings with a bronze bushing. Uh, so this is an XRC bronze bushing and it's a single piece machined out of a single piece of bronze. Uh, much tougher, 
um, it will last uh, the l lifetime of the, uh, the bike, basically, um, with some periodic lubrication. Um, but yeah, the, the main advantages are uh, there's no slit. Uh, if you install it correctly, um, it will perform very well and will not damage the cases and will not re need replacing. So uh, I recommend getting these uh, XRC bronze bushings. I sell them on the Tokyo Off-Road web shop in various kits to fit all year models. So uh, I'll put a link to those in the description of the video in, in case you want to look into those. And I'm going to be replacing the stock ignition cover with an XRC billet aluminium cover. Um, super beefy. It has this reinforced section here, uh, which on the stock uh, cover can be prone to rock damage and uh, puncturing the cover. Um, really superb construction, very, very strong. Uh, it comes pre-installed with a bronze uh, Bendix bushing here. So I'm going to be using this um, and installing it. And to remove the stock uh, Bendix bushing from the case, I'm using a blind bearing puller. So it's an 8mm blind bearing puller with a slide hammer and it should come out very easily. Yep, just pop straight out. Then once you've removed the bushing, uh, you want to inspect the bore. So I use some parts cleaner and compressed air to blow it out. And I can see the bore is in really good shape, so I can't see any damage at all. If, however, uh, you have a bike and the uh, bushing has been spinning in the bore, uh, it w might well have uh, worn the bore. And uh, if it's a very slight amount and uh, there's only a, a very small amount of play, uh, you can use some retaining compound uh, to hold a new bushing in place. If, however, the damage is uh, quite severe, uh, you'll need to either uh, repair the bore or uh, use a new case. Uh, repairing the, the case, you need to the best way is to weld it up and machine a new bore. Um, I have heard of people trying to use a JB Weld and typically that works for a while, uh, but it doesn't uh, typically hold up long term. So I re recommend uh, doing a, a welding repair or replace the case. Um, as that's quite a lot of work and uh, even repairing, um, if you're not doing it yourself, uh, can be expensive. Uh, that's a, a really good reason for doing a regular inspection and you know if you're using OEM bushings to replace those regularly or upgrade to uh, XRC bronze bushings. And the XRC bronze bushing kits come with a punch tool like this and uh, I recommend doing a test fit before you do the actual install. Um, so the new bushing if the case bore is undamaged should be a light press fit and that's not sliding in straight away. Um, so I think that's uh, very good. If it does slide in uh, straight away without any force, you'll need to use some uh, retaining compound to hold it in place or it will start spinning and will cause damage. So for installing uh, Bendix bushings, uh, the two retaining compounds I recommend using are either Loctite 648 or 638. Uh, the difference being 648 is intended for press or close fit, whereas uh, 638 is if it's a slip fit, so if the gap is larger. So in my case, uh, it's a press fit, so I'm going to be using some 648 to ensure uh, the bushing is held in place. If you have a, uh, a bushing which just drops in, uh, then use the 638. And I should note that the XRC bushings uh, stock, they come with one flat here and a slit uh, which is intended to go up. And uh, if you use oil, uh, the oil can drip down onto the flat and then go into the uh, shaft of the Bendix and lubricate the bushing and shaft. Um, so make sure that's up. And then one mod I, I like to make myself is to uh, file a second flat in this area. And that's intended to clear uh, this collar, uh, which holds the starter motor in position. So if you want to remo remove the starter motor, you need to remove the collar. Um, so I make the second flat so you can remove the collar without removing the bushing. So I recommend doing that on uh, the crankcase bushing. Okay, so I've applied a small amount of Loctite 648 to the outer surface of the uh, XRC bushing. And uh, you want to make sure you don't get any inside. Uh, if you do clean it out thoroughly and then you need to align it correctly with the uh, flat with a slit uh, up.
and I can feel it's fully um, installed now. An Eloctite retaining compound takes 24 hours to fully cure, uh, which in my case, because the bushing is a press fit, uh, doesn't really matter. I can install the Benex and use it straight away uh, with no risk. But if yours is loose, uh, you should definitely leave it for 24 hours before installing the Bendix and certainly before using it. And for lubrication, I'm using a lightweight spray oil, which doesn't tack up, which is in intended for this type of application. Um, whatever you do, don't use uh, oil which tacks up or a grease. Um, that can create lots of issues and uh, certainly don't recommend it. So I'm going to lube up the uh, Bendix bushing. Uh, the starter motor and then I'm going to go around the flywheel as well and lube that up and I recommend uh, re-lubing everything periodically so uh, and the advantage of using the oil is yeah it can be flung off the flywheel while it's spinning round but uh, because it doesn't tack up it can also drip back down um, onto the flywheel onto the Bendix bushings onto the starter motor And there it goes. So it's relatively easy. Uh, it was a lot more difficult uh, getting the Bendix into the new bushing than it was to take out of the uh, uh, OEM bushing. Um, so I think it's much better fit. There's uh, much less play. So I highly recommend using the XRC bushings. Or if you want to stick with the OEM bushings, because they are very cheap, um, I recommend replacing them regularly. And then for the ignition cover Bendix bushing, same process. I uh, use a blind bearing puller and install the new bushing. Um, I'm going to be using the XRC bushing, so I'm going to swap over uh, the uh, ignition uh, into the XRC cover. Okay, so I, I've finished installation of the XRC uh, ignition cover. A uh, couple of things to note. One is the uh, three screws. I used uh, medium strength thread lock on those to ensure they don't come loose. Um, on the carb models, there's only two screws, so that's one difference. Um, and also this clip, uh, make sure that's installed correctly. Uh, it's pretty important. It holds down the wiring in this point and stops it rubbing on the flywheel. Um, if you don't have the clip in correctly, um, it could rub and uh, create issues, obviously. And also before uh, finishing up your installation, lube up the uh, Bendix bushing here. And it's a good idea to use a new gasket. Um, it doesn't really have a lot of oil to keep in, but uh, you do want to keep oil and dirt out of it. So uh, you want to make sure that the gasket uh, creates a good seal. And one other detail is there's two dowels. So there's one dowel here and one dowel here. And make sure those are installed correctly. And uh, also you want to check that uh, all of the gasket uh, or the case sealing surfaces are clean and free from dirt. So that, that all looks good and I'm now ready to install uh, the ignition cover. So you want to lower it down very slowly. It will try and pull itself because of the... Uh, magnetic force and you want it to line it up on the Bendix and do not force anything. If it doesn't go on uh, initially, um, just kind of wriggle it around a little bit and make sure it's lined up. You don't want to force it down. Uh, you could do some damage to the cases if you uh, do force it. And that looks good. It's all lined up and uh, I can see uh, the cover is flush with the case and there's no gaps anywhere. So I can uh, go ahead and start installing the screws. And because I made my template, uh, there's no guesswork to where the screws go. Uh, so I've got a long one there and the other long one goes up here. And then all the others are the same. And then because it's uh, a reasonably large size cover you want to do it up in a crisscross pattern um, so I'm just snugging it down lightly and because there's a large number of fasteners there's no exact order but uh, just try and do it roughly in a crisscross pattern 
Okay, so I've hand tightened all of the uh, screws. Now I'm going to uh, torque them. And uh, the torque for the uh, cover is 10 Newton meters. So I'm going to do this in a crisscross pattern again. Again, there's a large number of fasteners, so there's no uh, exact order, but just try and do it roughly in a crisscross pattern. And I'm going to go around in order, uh, checking all of the screws. So 10 Newton meters is relatively low. Um, so if you don't have a good feel for tightening smaller fasteners, very good idea using a torque wrench. And now I'm ready to reinstall the shift lever and uh, make sure I get in the right position. Um, I've cleaned off uh, old Loctite from the screw and I did a test fit to make sure it, it fully uh, runs in without uh, too much force. And that was fine. And I'm using uh, Loctite 243 and you need to torque it to 14 Newton meters. Okay. Okay, so I've reconnected the battery. I've got my seat on. Uh, I've completed the starter system, uh, all of the checks and the maintenance. And the final thing to do is to check that the starter starts the bike. Uh, try it again. Perfect. Really pleased.